The first episode with Sam Harris has ended up getting a ton of backlash and made Sam Harris, um, or, or it, it looks like Sam is saying that he wishes, and what the way people are construing it or misconstruing it is that Sam was saying in his conversation with you that he wishes COVID-19 affected kids and killed kids rather than killed older adults. And the reason for that, he says, is like maybe people would have taken, in his view, the science more seriously, essentially been more vaccinated, hunkered down more. Sam was very much um, throughout the pandemic and continues to be somebody who's very much a proponent of, uh, uh, from my viewpoint anyway, lockdowns, vaccine mandates, uh, very harshly pro all of that stuff. Very different viewpoint than myself. Um, And... In this episode, it sounds like he's saying, well, had kids died, then everybody would have taken this a bit more seriously. Am I am I getting this controversy right? Explain the controversy and w- what <laughs> explain yeah. it. What's going on here? A lot yeah. of views, by the way, on this controversy. Can we just show this is um, the tweet video clip from your podcast that came out. And look at this. It has three point two million views or over three million views. And this is Alexandra Marino saying, what is it with Sam Harris and dead children? In his new interview with John Wood Jr., Sam Harris claims that in some sense we are unlucky that COVID didn't kill hundreds of thousands of children. And then he says what happened to him. And that video clip got over three million views. So what's your take on this? Right. Yes. So Sam, of course, um, you know, as you mentioned, Sam is somebody who essentially was amplifying what had been the mainstream sort of consensus of the of the health experts. Uh, I think he continues to lament the fact that so much doubt was cast on the efficacy of the vaccine. And he made the point that, you know, with all the same things being true about the state of the science and what was known and not known about COVID and the vaccines, uh, if you had just changed, you know, one thing, let's say, rather than the uh, rather than the pandemic, rather than COVID, uh, primarily impacting older people, but rather younger people, you know, say children, um, people's response to it would have been much different. They wouldn't have had as much of a tolerance for people distrusting the science, uh, the position of the experts. And in Sam's view, that would have led us to a better overall public health outcome because people would have taken the science more seriously. And so in making that point, he sort of tacked on to the end of that. In that sense, we were unlucky, right, uh, in the way it played out. And so that's been interpreted by a lot of people, I think, as... I don't think, I know, because I've been getting hit with comments, uh, you know, to this effect over and over and over again, that Sam wishes that kids had died so that he could advance sort of an authoritarian societal position. Now, the thing I want to make clear, Kim, is this. I am totally fine with people disagreeing with Sam Harris uh, on the science on whether or not the lockdowns were justified. You are a close friend of mine. Sam is somebody who I'm just getting to know a bit. Brett Weinstein, who really is a central uh, player in this controversy because so much of what I was talking to Sam about was why he was not talking to Brett in public about these issues, because Brett is, of course, famously critical of our public health response on COVID. But Brett is a good friend of mine. Um, You know, it is totally legitimate, I think, to criticize Sam on the substance uh, and to, you know, uh, to, to, to have Adam in terms of his position on the issues. But people are reading in intent in his words. They're reading motivation into it. As if, you know, Sam in his heart of hearts would have been totally fine with kids having died as long as that allowed us to inch closer towards statism. And the irony of that to me is that the focus of me and Sam's conversation and what I was trying to argue to him was the need for us to be able to have these conversations across these sort of volatile lines of disagreement so we could have, so we could humanize people who have different views um, on on the issue and allow all of us, therefore, to be to better be able to reason together on things that are as complicated as science and biology and their implications for public health in the context of a novel coronavirus, right? And um, what has played out to me is something that really just highlights, you know, just how dysfunctional the discourse is that in the midst of a conversation where I was arguing to Sam fundamentally that he should have talked to Brett, 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that we need to do everything we can do to bring these uh, these points of view into contact with each other in a way that's not demonizing. All sorts of folks, it seemed to me, started demonizing Sam by taking uh, this piece of this piece of uh, the the conversation out of context and sort of making him look like a, a person who's an absolute monster. And so, you know, it's it's a, just a beautiful example of the exact sort of thing that we're trying that I'm trying to change. Yeah. Well, and I and I, I understand completely what you're trying to do with Braver Angels and with your Nighting America podcast, you know, trying to get people to see both sides. And, um, you know, Sam Harris was one that was unwilling to really sit down and talk to Brett. Brett had tried mm -hmm. to get Sam to talk to him numerous times and Sam wouldn't do it. Um, and I think maybe some of the criticism, now I understand that you're kind of feeling like, oh, this kind of defeated the, po the purpose of the podcast, right? Like in a way, the, pe the way people are taking Sam's clip and then saying, look at what Sam is saying and then making it more of a divisive thing rather than bringing people together, which is kind of your whole ethos. But Sam Harris digs his own grave. I'm not going to, you know, he, the, the, he, you know, he said about when with the Hunter Biden laptop, for example, he said, quote, Hunter Biden literally could have had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared. OK, he said this to uh, trigger pod host uh, Constantin Kisson and Francis Foster mm -hmm. in a video clip that was viewed also millions of times on Twitter. So he, you know, he he makes these he says these things and this is just the second time he talks about dead kids and so it makes people go what the what in the world sam <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. to make your point yeah. um you know he's just so politically on one side of the aisle at this point he used to be part of what they called the intellectual dark web um and which meant people that were more open to talking to others or open to kind of dissenting ideas that were a little bit against the mainstream and he, ins he instead has, once COVID hit, seemed to have gone, maybe even since Trump, I'm not 100% certain when, um, but seemed to go really hardcore on one side and then just really was unwilling to talk to people. And then just making this comment of like, Hunter Biden could have had the corpses of children in his basement and I wouldn't have cared, um, to justify yeah. the suppression of his laptop, of, of that information. So, I mean, I, I get your sentiment on it and how you were feeling. And we were just talking before this interview about how you're kind of like, oh, you know, this was sort of defeating a little bit the purpose and you, mm -hmm. you wished people would be able to listen to one another because that is what you're all about is getting people to listen to each other, hear each other out, uh, you know. And, and like you mentioned, you and I are politically different, but very good friends. And that is sort of what you're wanting more and more of to see more of rather than the massive division we're he we're seeing here in America. But I don't know. Have you talked to Sam about this? Well, like, has he reached out or, or said anything to you since this? No, I haven't talked to Sam about uh, any of this since the since the episode, um, since we recorded the episode. So no, we, we haven't had any communication here. But the thing is, is that what I was actually arguing to him in the episode, you mentioned the intellectual dark web. So much of our conversation was my, you know, was our talking about and my sort of making the case that something deeply important um, in in American and, and international sort of intellectual and political life was lost with the collapse of the intellectual dark web because what you had with that was a vast network of people around the world and certainly in the United States. Uh, sort of being led in conversation by a group of thinkers and public personality distributed way across the spectrum who, because they were friends, because they had a baseline level of respect for each other, because they were not misrepresenting one another's intentions, and because they were committed for a while at least to trying to find the truth on seriously complicated issues together, were able to bring hundreds of thousands and even millions of people along with them for the ride in a way to where if that had been in place in a strong way, uh, during during the pandemic, during the debates over COVID-19, uh, we might have been able to sustain attention in a way that allowed us to ultimately arrive at some greater shared understanding of what was actually true or what we might generally or reasonably think to be true about the state of the science, whichever way uh, the preponderance of evidence actually broke, right? And, and, and so the thing that I was really trying to challenge Sam on was the idea that we need to maintain these networks of good faith and a vital sort of axis in that network of good faith was the relationship that existed between Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein. Uh, 
and that we basically needed the two of them to be able to have this conversation in a way that could bring their audiences together to sort of track the storyline, track the plot in a way that works. And you guys can watch the conversation I had with Sam to see how he responded to that. But the larger point is that the reason it's difficult for Sam for, for and for so many other people, uh, it's difficult for Brett too, um, is the fact that when we as public figures, and Kim, this is this is true for, for all of us, and you know this better than most, you know, we step out in front of the microphone, we step out in front of the camera, you don't have to make much of a step, uh, much of a mistake, much of a misstep for it to characterize and define everything that somebody thinks about you, your intentions, and the point that you're making without reference to the larger sort of argument that you may be bringing to a conversation. And when people attack you, the instinct is generally to attack back. It's natural, but the problem with that is that it delivers us into a spiral where we never actually fully integrate each other in into the conversation because suddenly we devolve into warring tribes and then we become easier to take advantage of by the media, by politicians, by corrupt institutions and establishments, as well as, as, well as uh, uh, toxic uh, uh, demagogues and people who profit from our divisions, right? We have yeah. to stop this spiral. I'm not saying that Sam Harris is, 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 is right on, on, on everything or on most things and that he hasn't said things that people may take to be offensive or, or theatrical or what have you. That's going to be true for him. That's going to be true for anybody who tries to do this sort of work for any sustained period of time. But we have to rise above that enough to have conversations in a way that works. The intellectual dark web was actually a great thing because it allowed for that. As imperfect as Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Brett and Heather and Eric and all of these folks were, it was the beginning of something that could have grown. And in the work that we're doing at Braver Angels, we want to see that sort of culture of discourse begin to grow, grow again, and grow more and grow for real. But we can't do it if we are content to simply demonize each other for their mistakes and to read the worst possible motives into people intentions. It's not something that I can just let slide. Yeah. Well, it does seem like it is more coming from certain subsets of both sides that are unwilling to talk to one another. So Sam, you know, who used to be part of this intellectual dark web, used to be willing to have these open conversations and sit down with a lot of different people. And he was very much criticized for that when he was doing it. Um, now, you know, he seems to have gone into a more of a tribal tribal zone and he's the one who was unwilling to talk to Brett, not the other way around. You know, Brett was willing and happy, would happily have yeah. had that conversation with Sam. Um, I, mm -hmm. I saw that unfold many times yeah, that's throughout. Why, that's, why I did want, that's why I did want to challenge Sam, right? And if folks yeah. watch the conversation, we will see that not only did I challenge Sam, but that was the <laughs> main point of the conversation. Right? right. We don't right. get around to talking about Brett in specific terms till later in the conversation. But I mean, that was the point. Right. And look, I understand why Sam, given what he believed to be true, might not have wanted to talk to Brett because he felt that he would have been opening the floodgate on information that he considered to be dangerous. But look, what people believe is going to get out to the world anyway. It's only by coming into contact with each other and other ways of looking at things that we can open somebody else's mind or have our own minds open to what the truth may be. One other thing we talked about, Kim, since this is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, Sam and I, uh, was the legacy of Martin Luther King and how his philosophy of nonviolence can inform the way in which we have these conversations today. And the thing that I just want to double click on for people as we think about the legacy of King beyond awkward looking uh, monuments and statues, um, naughty looking monuments and statues. <laughs> yeah. what, King believed, what King believed was that even if somebody, not only if somebody disagrees with you, but if somebody absolutely hates you, so a bad way, that we nevertheless have to engage in with them, but to, to wish the best for them and to try and call out the best in them by calling out the best in ourselves, by being able to put ourselves forward as people who are of good faith, understanding the fact that that's not always the response you're going to get from somebody who's threatened by your view. Maybe that's not usually the response you're going to get. But if we can put ourselves forward in a way that shows that we are not at the end of the day, each other's enemies, but people who ultimately have to share a country together, then we can begin to tone down the heat in the conversation and open up the space for open-mindedness, 
open up the space for understanding and possibly reconciliation in a way that can actually allow us to fix democracy together, to build communities together, to solve problems together, and to live together tomorrow. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. Taught. That I believe in, and that's what I think we can still accomplish in the United States of America if we can just get out of our own damn way. John Wood Jr., thank you so much for being here. Host of Uniting America with John Wood Jr. You can check that out on YouTube. That link is down below. And I am the next guest on that podcast. So that is coming out on Thursday. And of course, you can watch the controversial podcast with Sam Harris. I don't know if I want mine to be as controversial or not. I'm still trying to decide. Do I? <laughs> You know, no, is it a good know. thing? Uh, but anytime, certainly, we, anytime I hang out with you, it's probably asking for controversy too. So that's, yeah. that's right. Well, yeah. Mike, you know, what's interesting is that my viewpoint was so opposite of Sam. So my episode with you, we do talk about also the COVID mm -hmm. stuff a bit. And, you know, I have an, a completely opposite view than Sam Harris. So it's interesting. But John, thank you so much for being here. Opinion columnist for USA Today, ambassador for Braver Angels, again, host of Uniting America with John Wood Jr., Thanks for being here. Thank you, Kim. It's important now more than ever to diversify your portfolio. We don't know what's in store for the future with all of this inflation and geopolitical instability. I'm a big fan of investing in gold and have been my entire life. My family taught me always that gold was the way to go because it's so stable. And one popular way to invest in gold is through a precious metals IRA, which allows you to convert your current IRA or 401k into an account that holds physical gold and other precious metals. And Birch Gold makes it really easy to do that. You can get a free info kit by visiting birchgold.com slash Kim. For thousands of years, gold has withstood economic and political turmoil. Having a precious metals IRA can provide a hedge against market fluctuations and give you more confidence in your financial future. You can also buy gold through Birch Gold in the form of coins or bars, if that's what you prefer. So visit birchgold.com slash Kim to get your free info kit. All right, guys, we are shutting down the stream right now. If you are anywhere other than Rumble, then you want to be over there because this stream is going Rumble exclusive from here on out. We're going to be talking about the latest uh, big news coming out of the CDC and also New York judges in uh, really talking about the vaccines, um, vaccine safety signals uh, regarding strokes, also New York judges. Uh, striking down vaccine mandates for certain people. We're going to be diving into that. So you want to be over on Rumble if you're not yet.